Okay, so maybe I, I will start. So in, his last, in the last lecture, Jens introduced the hyperbolic plane and described some of its basic geometry. And then he showed how the unit tangent bundle of the hyperbolic plane can be identified with the group PSL2R and how this is very useful if you want to give simple algebraic formulas for, for the geodesic flow and for the horocycle flow. And at the very end, he briefly mentioned that this, uh, all of these transfers down to any hyperbolic surface, where now the hyperbolic plane will be the universal covering surface of that, but, but the formulas for the geodesic flow and the horocycle flow transfer down to the hyperbolic surface. And today I will start doing that a bit more carefully. So G today will be the Lie group PSL2R. Recall that this is the special linear group of order two. So the group of two by two matrices, real matrices with determinant one, but you mod out with sign changes. So you identify any two matrices if they are just the negates of each other. So this is modulo plus minus identity matrix. And then today we will also fix some discrete subgroup. Let gamma be some discrete subgroup of G. So this is simply some subgroup which as a set is discrete. So one example which will, will be very important for us is to take gamma equals PSL2Z. The group of all integer matrices with determinant one. And then we will be interested in the homogeneous space X equals G modulo gamma. So this is the, as, as uh, you saw in the introductory lecture, this is the, as a set, this is just the set of all left cosets, gamma G, where G goes through the group G. And, and locally, since gamma is discrete, locally this looks just like the group G, but we have identified various points of G. Um, here. Ah, <laughs> yeah. G modulo gamma. Sorry. <laughs> what am I? Okay. And the point now for, for this special group G P equals PSL2R, which can be identified with the unit tangent bundle of the hyperbolic plane. It follows that this, this homogeneous space can also be viewed as the unit tangent bundle of the hyperbolic plane modulo the action of gamma. I will say a bit more about what this means very soon. So this is using the identification that G can be identified with the unit tangent bundle of H. Um, this is the map. I think Jens called it Psi in his lecture. And then this is almost the same as the unit tangent bundle of the hyperbolic surface, H mod gamma. It is the same, at least if there is no torsion in gamma. So this is if there is no torsion. in gamma. Otherwise, they are almost the same, but, but if there, there is some elliptic element in gamma that fixes some point in the hyperbolic plane, then this hyperbolic surface will have a conical point, and it's a bit, maybe not well defined to speak about its unit tangent bundle. Okay, but I, I want to say, what, what is this? H mod gamma. So that is a hyperbolic surface.
And it is, by definition, it's the, what we get if we take H, but we identify points which are equivalent under the action of gamma. So, uh, so here, this sim is the equivalence relation, saying that any two points in the upper half plane are equivalent are equivalent if there is some element in gamma that brings one point to the other. So, so this is the hyperbolic plane, but we have identified certain points. And, uh, but locally, unless we are at a, such an elliptic point that is fixed by elements of gamma, this, locally this looks exactly like the hyperbolic plane. So all the structure of the hyperbolic plane transfers to, to this hyperbolic surface. We have the hyperbolic metric giving the hyperbolic area measure and so on. So let me just show an example of what this looks like in, in the, the example which will be most important for us when gamma is equal to PSL to Z. Um, if gamma is equal to PSL to Z, um, then a fundamental domain for the action of gamma on the hyperbolic plane is given by the following set. So I will say what the fundamental domain is. A fundamental domain for gamma acting on H is, and this is the standard choice of a fundamental domain. It's, it's always done in the literature in the last century or so. So the following set, consider the following set in the upper half plane. The set of all points in H such that the real part of Z is less than or equal to one half, and the absolute value of z is larger than or equal to one. So um, here's a picture of that. So we, we consider all points which lie, lie outside this circle, and they should also have real part between one half and minus one half. So, so it's this domain. And I've taken it to be a closed set. So it includes all the boundary. This is F. And why uh, fundamental domain means that basically it contains exactly one representative for each equivalence class here. But I've included some boundary, so there is some overrepresentation, but only at the boundary. So, so, so to state that in precise sense, uh, so, so H um, if I consider all the translates of this F by elements of the group gamma, then I will get a perfect covering of H. Um, so it's almost a disjoint union, except I have some overlap in the boundary. So, so this is a union of all the images of F by elements of gamma and there is only overlap in the boundary. So, so if I take any two images of F, gamma 1F and gamma 2F, then the interiors of these are disjoint. Sorry, for any gamma 1, gamma 2 in gamma. So this is what, what it means to be a fundamental domain. I mean, depending on the context, sometimes one considers open fundamental domains, sometimes closed ones, sometimes abstract ones. And then one would insist that they are truly disjoint and exactly covering H. Okay, and so now to see, to see what, the pic, what the hyperbolic surface actually looks like, we can, one can also point out what are the identifications. Well, there is one map in gamma, which identifies, which is just translation, um, 
this map is in gamma, and, and it acts on the hyperbolic plane by just taking z to z plus one, and that clearly identified, identifies these two sides. And then there is also another map, which is the rotation uh, half uh, so angle pi around the point i, and that is the map 0 minus 1, 1 in gamma, which gives this identification. And then it turns out that, so th this shows that the point i is actually an elliptic point of order 2. And, and it turns out, if you compose this in the right way, actually this point here uh, is also an elliptic point of order 3. So, but now you can, if you do this folding, you see that this is a surface of genus 0. And so topologically, it's just a sphere. But we have these two special elliptic points. And we have a cusp also. So it's not a compact surface. And the picture in general for will be kind of similar. So always, if, if gamma is a lattice, meaning that this hyperbolic surface has finite area, then we can always find a very similar domain, a, 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 some convex domain, convex with respect to the hyperbolic geometry, with a finite number of sides, such that the hyperbolic surface, you get it by just identifying, this, identifying the sides in pairs and folding. OK. So now, um, so now we have this understanding of the homogeneous space X. Um, so, so this, by this I mean just uh, I take the unitangent bundle of H and identify points according to the action of gamma. So similar definition as here. And then as I said, if gamma doesn't have any torsion in it, there are no elliptic elements in gamma, then we can identify it completely with the unitangent bundle of H. But, but even in the remaining cases, we can say that it's, we understand what it looks like in the elliptic points, and we, we, see, we can see that they are similar. So, so now we have a very good picture of, <clears throat> of, of this homogeneous space, which I said is a really important homogeneous space for us. Um, so in this special case, when gamma is equal to PSL2Z, then um, X equals G mod gamma um, is, the, is up to some, well, up to this minor uh, problem with elliptic points. It's the same thing as the unit tangent bundle of this hyperbolic surface here. But let me also point out that this is the same as SL2Z without the P. Uh, so SL2R modulo SL2Z without the P. And the reason for this is that the uh, minus the identity element is in here. So, so you get exactly the same quotient. <laughs> Because minus identity element is in SL2Z, these are the same. So, so as I said uh, in, in the first lecture, this homogeneous space, and also for higher order, so SLDR modulo SLDZ, is, is going to be a very important space for us. In that lecture, I said that this space can be identified with the space of all lattices in, in R2 in this case. So that's a completely different way of viewing this space that we will come back to in a later lecture. But the point here is that when d is equal to 2, we also have this picture of the space. It's the unit tangent bundle of this hyperbolic surface. OK. But now when I continue talking, gamma will be a general discrete group, not necessarily the, the PSL2Z. OK. So now let's uh, remind ourselves about the flows, which Jens introduced in last lecture. How do, do they look like? 
Oh, you want to see a picture of this tessellation? Yeah, uh, so obviously, if you translate, you get just this. But I guess somebody can Google and you will see nice pictures of these tessellations. It's very. <laughs> and then another copy, if you rotate it by, by this, you get, you get something like that, or you get. Ex but then. <laughs> uh, is it. Doesn't it look like. Well, I shouldn't embarrass myself by. I, I suggest you Google and you get this tessellation, or we can do it. <laughs> Sorry for. <laughs> But obviously, it will look, uh, when you look down here, it will, as since the geometry of the hyperbolic plane is as it is, it will look really <laughs> fractal like or something. OK. So um, now let's remind ourselves about the flows which Jens introduced. However, let's immediately define these as flows on the homogeneous space. G mod gamma, and recall, or, or that means the unit tangent bundle of our hyperbolic surface. So we had the geodesic flow, um, and uh, so in, in Jens' lecture, this was a flow on the group G, and it was defined by taking uh, G to the point G of AT where AT is this diagonal matrix. However, now we can define this also on the uh, homogeneous space by just saying that the point, the coset gamma G is mapped to gamma G AT. And you can very easily check that this is well defined. It doesn't depend on which representative of the coset I choose. The reason being that I have gamma on the left, but I'm acting on the right by AT. And similarly, Jens, we had the horocycle flow, and now on the surface, or on the homogeneous space, this will be given by gamma G N T, where N is this unipotent matrix, 1, T, 1, 0. And we have the um, opposite horocycle flow given by, by gamma G N T. T minus, where n t minus is 1 t 1 0. OK. And, and Jens showed you yesterday that this is really the, the stable horocycle flow for, for this geodesic flow. So it's, it's a flow along the stable manifold for, for phi of t. Now I will draw a slightly, slightly different picture, or I will just point out the following fact. Note that if I, if I take, well, this is a formula, and this formula captures very easily, captures in a neat way the fact that this is the stable horocycle flow for, for this geodesic flow. Um, yeah, it's just a formula. Phi t composed with hs is equal to um, h of s e to the minus t composed with phi t for any t and any s. So this will be an exercise to check it. Clearly, it has, it's some commutativity relation between the matrices a, t, and n, s. And what it means is the following. If I take any point on my, in my homogeneous space or in my unit tangent bundle, gamma g, and I flow with the horocycle flow, for time s, I get the point h, s, gamma, g. On the other hand, I can flow with the geodesic flow, which is really chaotic, so I want to have some red alarming color, but here. Um, I can flow with the geodesic flow for time t. I can do that to both these points. And then I get phi t, gamma, g, and then I could flow for a certain time with the horocycle flow, and the point is that I get back to a certain point here in very short time. The, I have to flow with the horocycle flow only for time s times e to the minus t here. Uh, and then I get the same point as I get by taking phi t, flowing time t with this point. Um, so. so the point is that this horocycle, which may be 
fairly long, has, has shrunk exponentially here after. So it's just, maybe I write it out, it's h s e to the minus t um, phi t gamma g. And this is true for any point gamma g in the unit tangent bundle. So, so I won't do it now, but uh, now you could also consider the derivatives along the flow directions, and this will give you at any point gamma g, it gives you a splitting of the tangent bundle of the unit tangent bundle of the hyperbolic surface into a direct sum of three one-dimensional subspaces. And this gives a splitting of the bundle that, that is invariant by the flows and such that if you take a tangent vector in the flow direction of HS, that is contracted exponentially by the geodesic flow and so on. So you, this splitting gives you the fact that this is an Anosov flow. I just say that without doing it. So here we have the stable manifolds for, uh, for the, that flow. Okay. So now um, I, uh, uh, the, I will give the first theorem, um, simply saying that phi of t, this geodesic flow, but also the horocycle flows are, are ergodic and are also mixing. This was proved first by Hopf, 1939, Using, using this uh, geometry involving stable and unstable manifolds and, and Birkhoff's ergodicity theorem. And it's a very nice proof and it's fairly short, but I will not give it. I will just state it and then I will, I hope to say something stronger. Theorem one. Um, all these flows, phi t and h t, both the both of the horocycle flows, they are mixing, and hence ergodic. So I won't talk about what ergodicity means, but I'm sure that many or most of you are well aware of it. They are mixing as, as flows on, oh sorry, I should have introduced the uh, volume measure also. So I have to introduce mu before stating this. They are mixing on, on, on x provided with its Liouville measure mu. So, so, so okay before stating the theorem, let, let mu be har measure on G. And, and Jens discussed har measure yesterday. You have explicit formulas on, for it on, on, the, on PSL2R. And we will assume that gamma is a lattice. So we assume that the homogeneous space, if I take a fundamental domain for it in, in G, it has finite measure with respect to mu. And this is equivalent to assuming that the corresponding hyperbolic surface has finite area, easy to see. And when we have done this assumption, we can just as well renormalize the Haar measure. So it's not going to be given by exactly the formula which Jens had before, but, but you, you uh, change it by a constant. So we actually assume that, uh, that mu is a probability measure on the homogeneous space. And uh, if I didn't do it, let me stress that I write x also for this homogeneous space. So now we have x provided with a, 
uh, a probability measure. A Liouville measure for. Okay. Um, and let, so, here's the statement. These flows are mixing. And let me remind you what mixing means. It means that for any functions, any test functions, I can take them to be L2 functions on X. Um, if I consider F1 composed with phi t and, and uh, take its inner product with F2 over X. Then as t goes to plus or minus infinity, this tends to just the average of F1 times the average of F2. Okay, so, so the reason why, why do we call this mixing? Well, think of the case when F1 and F2 are characteristic functions of some sets. Maybe take some nice sets. And F1 and F2 are the characteristic functions of these sets. Then what this says is that if I, if I, um, if I uh, let one of the sets flow by the geodesic flow, it will spread out evenly all over the surface because it's integral against any other nice set uh, tends to the um, tends to become proportional to the area of that other set, so to say. I mean, I, so if you think about F1 and F2 being characteristic functions, it's clear why, why this result should be called a mixing of the flow. Okay. And I have a couple of remarks. Um, so Hopf proved this using these properties of, of, of uh, expanding and contracting um, submanifolds and so on. But, uh, but one can obtain this with a very good exponential rate. In, in fact, one can have a really explicit understanding of the rate in this particular case when, when we have just a homogeneous space. So let me give a for, um, one formulation of this. So. If you want the rate in this result, then you have to take F1 and F2 to be fairly nice functions. There is no possibility of having a rate for arbitrary L2 functions. It is, is to show constructions that you can't have any explicit rate for, <laughs> for, for this in this space of functions. But uh, so here, uh, let me take, um, just to have a simple formulation, assume that F1 and F2 are compactly supported and smooth functions. Then the error, so I mean the difference between this and this side uh, as will be bounded by some constant times, so, so, so we will have exponential mixing. The decay is exponential. And we can even get a very precise understanding of the constant here. The constant is typically just minus one half, unless we have small eigenvalues of the Laplace operator on the surface. So it's one half plus epsilon. And, and then, if the, so, so I will just write something out. If there is some small eigenvalue, so lambda one, let lambda one be the smallest non-zero eigenvalue of the Laplace Beltrami operator on the surface. Um, So, so uh, where lambda one is the smallest uh, eigenvalue, so smallest non-zero eigenvalue of the Laplace Beltrami operator on the hyperbolic surface. So if there are no small eigenvalues, and small eigenvalue here means an eigenvalue less than a quarter. If there are no small eigenvalues, then, uh, then this is just minus one half plus epsilon. But if there is some small eigenvalue, then the rate is worse. And if the spectral gap, so lambda is captures the spectral gap, 
if, if lambda is close to zero, then this constant will be small. We have minus one half plus something near one half. So, so the constant is small. But it's an exponential rate, all the same. So if I get time, I will try to show how one, I mean, just give a brief outline how, how you prove such a result later on. <laughs> um, so, so one can prove it using a representation theory. And this is a result about decay of matrix coefficients. This is really a matrix coefficient for a, for a certain representation. And also, I, another remark. Um, so if you have mixing for the geodesic flow, then it is easy to get mixing also for the horocycle flows. And what you do is, um, you note that this matrix, NT, here, you Cartan decompose this matrix. So Cartan decomposition um, is a general decomposition of any element in the group G. And it says that any element can be decomposed as a, some element in the compact group, SO2, times an element in the, the diagonal group, times some other element in SO2. Um, it's more or less unique. And so, so these are in SO2, and I think Jens introduced the notion, notation K for SO2. This is in SO2. And this is a diagonal matrix, like over there. And, and it turns out if you compute this, you find that as, as when t is large, the value of t prime here will be approximately 2 times logarithm of absolute value of t as absolute value of t tends to infinity. So this shows. And, and these, these are in some compact groups, so, so there's no problem dealing with this. You can, deal uniform, you can have a result which is uniform with respect to what, both of these. So, so it's, it's not hard from that to show that you, if you want a, a result with a rate, you will get a polynomial rate for the horocycle flow because you have this logarithm. But you can get hold of exactly the polynomial rate of decay for, for the mixing for the horocycle flow using this relation. OK. So as I said, I hope to say a few words about how to prove mixing with a really precise rate. Or oh, I should mention that, of course, you can get exponential decay for, for mixing in much more general situations. For example, Dolgo Piat has proved that you have a, uh, uh, such an exponential mixing result for, for any also flow with some, some conditions. Okay. But uh, that is much more, more difficult than, uh, so it's a very different methods. For, for this result on the homogeneous space, we have access to representation theory, which is really a powerful tool which, where you can get really precise understanding of everything involved here. Okay, so I wanted to turn to an application of this mixing result uh, to prove an equidistribution result, namely equidistribution of expanding translates of horocycles. And this is um, something that is used all over and over again in, in in homogeneous dynamics, the fact that you can get such equidistribution fairly easily, and uh, it has numerous applications, as you will see in later lectures. This is this fact extended to higher dimensional settings. So, here's here's a theorem. So I will consider a piece of a horocycle, and the, the starting point will be I call the starting point P. P is a point in my unit tangent bundle of the hyperbolic surface. And then I fix a length of this initial horocycle piece. And then let curly H be the horocycle starting at P and having length U. And 
And the claim is that if I take this piece of a horocycle and I transport it by the geodesic flow, as in the, the picture which I just removed, then as t goes to minus infinity, this tends to become more and more equidistributed in x. Clearly, t has to go to minus infinity because when t goes to, to infinity, it becomes more and more just like a point, as this picture shows. So now we are going the other way. So phi th equidistributes in x mu as t goes to minus infinity. And, and more what I mean by that is that if I take an arbitrary test function, a bounded continuous test function or equivalent, it is, I would say, compactly supported continuous test function, then if I integrate my test function along this horocycle, so I take the average of the test function along this transported horocycle, which is again a horocycle. So um, phi t h u p du, and I take an average, so I take one over u here. As t goes to minus infinity, this tends to the volume average of f. Okay, so, so a picture, I had the picture over there. You, the point is we are now, let me draw a picture on the, here's my three manifold, the unit tangent bundle. And I have some horocycle H and I'm transporting it with a geodesic flow but backwards. So if I would go this way, I would shrink the horocycle exponentially. But now I'm going the other way. So the horocycle becomes a longer and longer curve. And if I go sufficiently long, now in the picture I don't go very far, but here is phi t h. But if I go very long, then this curve will spread out all over the surface in a more and more evenly distributed way, as this shows. Yeah. Sorry? Aha. Uh -huh. I'm writing too small, maybe. So it's F phi T H U of P. Maybe I rub it out and write it in larger signs. F phi T H U P. Sorry? No, no, u is, I integrate always, u goes only between zero and my fixed number, capital U. D, du, du is the parametrization. P is a fixed point. Yeah. Yeah, so, I don't know, maybe, maybe it's better to write it something like this. Um, so, this is the average along the horocycle. It's HTP. This is my horocycle. And then I want to plug this. I mean, if I write this and I take some test function and plug it into, then it is a one dimensional measure along the horocycle. Now I actually plug it into F composed with phi T or something like that. And I average. I don't know. Say again. T goes to minus infinity, very importantly. Ah, the, the, so, and do I repeat the same stupidity? No, I didn't. So, so it's U here, of course. <laughs> in this, in the picture, ah, thanks, thanks. That's, so P is here, just a, a starting point of a horocycle. 
T is the starting point, and then this is the horror cycle I get by following the horror cycle flow for a fixed time u. <laughs> this is H capital U of P. What, uh, ah, so, so it's, <laughs> I've been, uh, yeah, it looks the same, I guess, uh, more or less. So I just told you that this is a three-dimensional picture if you want to believe it, but if you want to see this as just the hyperbolic surface, I would draw the same picture. Uh, okay, okay, but, but with the unit, okay, so I see what you mean, maybe, as, as Jens wrote it. Here's the horror cycle, and then... Here's the geodesic flow, and, and the, okay. So this is really some, ah, I'm, I'm not sure if this is a good, this would be one, if it happens to be, if the point P happens to be a unit tangent vector pointing upwards, then the horror cycle would look like this. And I would have all these unit tangent vectors. And then I follow the geodesic flow, but backwards, so that this is expanding. And I will get a really long horror cycle curve down here. <laughs> yeah, I was actually going to mention. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Say again. Okay, I didn't hear, but I'm considering the, the orbit, the horror cycle orbit of the point P, but just for a finite fixed time. Yeah, and then, so here is phi T of P, and here is phi T of H U of P. Um, yeah, clearly I must learn to present this in a better way on <laughs> next lecture. I mean, next time I give the course. Ah, I, I will come to that. that. Here I state it just for some interval, but okay, I will point out the corollary. Okay, so yeah, maybe we can, I will be happy to try to explain it more in, in the tutorials. Um, yeah, I wanted to point out that one application of this, um, one special case would be if H is a piece of a closed toro cycle for instance, in the modular group, as I had before, then perhaps I have my fundamental domain of the modular group sitting here. And then, uh, since I have a cusp, in this case, there is an associated family of closed horocycles. If I have a completely horizontal horocycle here, then it's clearly a closed curve on, on the surface. I come back to the same point after having flowed a certain time. And uh, so there is a one parameter family of closed torus cycles. They can be parameterized by the length, for instance. And uh, when I'm flowing in this direction with the geodesic flow, I'm, uh, the, the length of the horror cycle is increasing exponentially. And I have a, well, so, these, so this says that a really long closed torus cycle sitting down here and, and uh, if I want to see it on the surface, I have to pull back. I have to take each point on this horror cycle and pull it back by the appropriate element in PSL to Z. I will get some curve, which I can't draw, <laughs> but uh, I will get some curve inside this fundamental domain. And the point is that this curve, when, when the horror cycle is really long, 
it will be look almost equidistributed it, according to the hyperbolic area measure. And even if we lift it to the unit tangent bundle, we will have equidistribution also direction-wise. Date, ah, well, that, okay, many, I think Selberg has it in unpublished work in this case, at least in some setting there. But, but Sarnak, the paper by Sarnak, uh, which we have in our list of references, 1981, well, he proved it, okay, no, 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 he didn't prove it, he proved it for closed torus cycles. Um, so who should one, uh, okay, Eskin and McMullen, they do it more generally, so maybe one, Eskin and McMullen, uh, 96, I think. That would, but I'm not sure if there is a bet. Again. Ah, Margulis. Ah, in Margulis' thesis, it is, the, ah, yes, of course. Uh, I'm going to explain the proof of this. And the proof, you can prove it using a certain thickening technique, or it's also called Margulis' trick. And he, he actually pointed this out for, for more general and also flows in his, PhD thesis, so oh, sorry, this, this is way, yeah, it was much earlier, sometimes late 60s maybe, or early, early 70s. Margulis thesis, so this is rubbish. I mean, no, 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 the papers are, <laughs> the papers are not rubbish. <laughs> yeah. Sorry? Okay. So I want to outline the proof of this. But I first want to point out that from this you can actually generalize it more or less directly by, by noticing that we get the same limit for any piece of a horror cycle. Then this means you can, using that just, you can, one can see that instead of having Lebesgue measure along a piece of a horror cycle. We can have just any absolutely continuous measure on, on the real line, any absolutely continuous probability measure, say, and we will get the same limit. And we are also free to let the test function f depend on this parameter u. This is technically very useful in many applications. So, so I will leave it as an exercise to prove it, and I'm happy to discuss it and so on, but I want to state it in a precise way. Corollary um, for any absolutely continuous probability measure new on the real line. So absolutely continuous with respect to Lebesgue measure. And again, say for any compactly supported test function on x, we have that if I instead, I take the same average as here, but with respect to the measure nu instead. So f phi t h u p d nu u. And this again tends to the same, the, the volume average of f as t goes to minus infinity. And even, as I said, for any test function, and now it's a compactly supported function on the space r times x, and, and I do the same integral, but I now let, I, I now have two parameters in f, and I let f depend also, I have u comma, phi t h u p d nu u. And this again tends to the same thing. So f depends also on the parameter u. And the proof of this is, is quite simple. Uh, you, you basically, you decompose. Okay, um, so I leave it as an exercise. So we will discuss it as an exercise, but yeah. Really no, no, any assumption of the regularity of the density? No, no, by approximation, clearly we can take, uh, replace the, then, yeah, because 
f is a bounded function, so, so I'm, I can approximate the density by, in L1 sense. So, so I can easily reduce to nice, compactly supported, continuous density. Ah, right, I don't get the same limits. Thank you, thank you. Clearly, you have to integrate now. So R times X, and then F um, U comma P. D U, no, 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 no. D, D, D nu, no, D, and then the other order, D mu P, and, and D nu U, the same average here. Ah, so that is no, no good notation, so, thank you, Q maybe? Q, sorry if it's not legible. So this is an exercise if you, to, 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 to deduce this corollary from the theorem. But now, in the last six or seven minutes, I hope to just outline the proof. Um, the, uh, one proof of this theorem, this equidistribution theorem, using a so-called Margulis trick or Margulis thickening technique, which he introduced in his PhD thesis. And it will use the fact that the geodesic flow is mixing. Outline of proof. So we would like to apply the mixing theorem with F1, if you, okay, I just erased the mixing theorem, but, but you have two test, arbitrary test functions, F1 and F2, in the mixing result. You would like to take F1 to be equal to the test function F, and then you would like F2 to be a one-dimensional measure along the horror cycle. If you were allowed to do that in the mixing result, you would get this directly. So I just run, write this out want to apply theorem one, the mixing, the fact that the geodesic flow is mixing, with F1 as the given test function F, and F2 as one-dimensional Lebesgue measure along the horror cycle piece H, the fixed given horror cycle piece H. Lebesgue so the so one-dimensional Lebesgue along H. However, this is a dis distribution. It is not an L2 function. And the mixing result doesn't extend to arbitrary distributions or arbitrary measures. It's easy to show by examples. It doesn't. For example, if I would take an average along the unstable horror cycle instead and then flow backwards in time, it, it clearly I would get some result which is false, so, so I'm not allowed to, to do this. But still, so, so okay, this is forbidden. But still, one can start asking, what happens if I try to approximate uh, this Lebesgue measure by some, some, some characteristic function, some tube around H? And the, it turns out that since H is an average, it's an unstable curve, for the expanding geodesic flow, I mean, I'm flowing in the direction such that it expands, since I'm averaging along a, a, an unstable uh, piece uh, of, uh, since I'm expanding along an unstable submanifold, this approximation will work. It, it will work when I, so, okay, so, so the trick is to thicken the horror cycle piece H. And, uh, okay, we, maybe I want to leave the statement of the theorem, so I, I move uh, here and discuss what happens.
So, okay, we want to thicken H. So we fix some small epsilon. And, and let H sub epsilon be an epsilon neighborhood of H. Now this is not completely, this is a bit vague because I've never introduced a metric on, 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 on G. One could introduce a metric and this would make sense. But I'm, I'm outlining the idea of the proof. Then uh, I hope to say a bit more about how, how you can make it more precise. So this is an epsilon tube around my, the, the fixed toro cycle piece H. And let F2 be the characteristic function of, of this tube. So characteristic function of H epsilon. But let's normalize it so that it, is, that it has total mass one. So I divide by the, uh, the volume of the tube so that F2, the total volume average of F2 is one. Okay. And now we want to see what happens if I flow this tube. I had this initial horror cycle H, and now I have fixed some epsilon neighborhood of it in some three-dimensional neighborhood, which is H epsilon. Ah, yeah, of course, thanks. Okay, so I have H and I have H epsilon. And we flow with the geodesic flow. And uh, I know that the curve H well, by definition, that tends, uh, becomes the curve phi t h. So t is negative, and the geodesic flow is, is going in this direction. But the point of this proof, and I'm not going to prove it, I'm just stating it, the point is that actually uh, also phi t of h epsilon is a nice neighborhood of phi t h. It remains so when t goes to infinity, minus infinity. And the reason is that um, the horror cycle itself is the unstable direction for the flow. And uh, so, so when I um, go out, go, go away from this horror cycle piece, I'm moving along, I can see it as moving along the geodesic direction and the other horror cycle direction, which is stable, so contracting for, for the geodesic flow. So, so that approximation, when I transfer it by phi, will remain a small approximation. <laughs> of course, uh, some point sitting here, say uh, um, one third between the starting point and the end point, that po point can move quite far along this unstable direction, and it can... Uh, but, but the, if, you go th if you write down this with coordinates, it turns out that that averaging remains nicely. It, it spreads out nicely, so, so the, that averaging remains good. So that's the point of it. I'm going to write something. Yeah. It's basically epsilon. Um, okay, so you have to introduce coordinates. And the point is that you, you don't have to take epsilon neighborhood. You can even take some fixed one neighborhood in, along the unstable direction, uh, the stable direction. But, but it will remain epsilon if you have fixed the metric and so on. It, it will remain. So, so, so in this proof, we can fix epsilon and, and, and we get the result. And then only at the very end, we will let epsilon go to zero to, to get a good approximation. A bit vague. And you, yeah, I want to write at least a few lines to, to say something. So the point here is that phi t of H epsilon is near the transported horocycle piece. And this means that here now, to conclude the proof or this hand waving proof, here's the thing that I wanted to compute. I wanted to compute F of phi T of H U P. The U, one of the U. 
And since this, here I'm moving along this transported horror cycle. And since the tube phi t h epsilon is, is always near this, and the averaging is as it should be, this turns out to be approximately equal to f phi t p and f2 p. Remember, f2 is the characteristic function of, of h epsilon and d mu p. Because, I mean, this is an indicator. This uh, kicks in only when p is in the epsilon neighborhood of h u, and that means that p is in, in h u, is in the original h, and then I get exactly this. <laughs> So this, uh, the, how good this approximation is depends on epsilon. But um, now, here I can apply the mixing result. This, as t goes to minus infinity or plus infinity, if you like, this tends to the volume average of f d mu times the volume average of f2 d mu x. And, and this... I chose this so it's equal to one. Otherwise, this approximation, there would be a constant here. Okay, so that's really hand waving. I was, yeah, hope to give a bit more details maybe in the tutorial, so, so. thank you.